Roma Agrawal, and like all of us, I'm one and many things. I'm an engineer, an author, I'm a mother, a wife, and an immigrant. I'm brown, and I'm short to name a few. So I guess it's a bit ironic that as a short person, I was one of the engineers involved in creating the tallest building in Western Europe, the Shard. As an engineer, I'm always curious. How do other people experience these structures once I'm done with them? So what I'd like to do is to take you for a walk around the city and to share stories of places that hold a special meaning for me, for the person that I am. I hope that we can dig a little deeper into the fabric of a city and unearth the many human layers that lay behind those glass and brick facades. Because, after all, any act of cultural creation never has just one person or one story behind it. Bridges hold a really special place for me, not only because they literally make connections between people, but also because as a fresh-faced young female engineering graduate, the very first project that I ever got to work on was a bridge. There are bridges which have really fascinating stories behind them, and I'm standing under one of them. This is the Waterloo Bridge, and it's often known as the Women's Bridge because it was built by a workforce that was predominantly female. But my favourite story of the woman behind the bridge is that of Emily Roebling, who was responsible for the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge in Manhattan. The reason I really loved the story of the Brooklyn Bridge is because there was a woman behind the project, and that was pretty much unheard of in the mid-1800s. Emily was the wife and the daughter-in-law of the two engineers that were originally in charge of the bridge. Unfortunately, her father-in-law died, and then her husband became very ill because of his work on site. Scared for her family's legacy on the bridge, she learned engineering. She took notes from her husband. She convinced funders and politicians that the project should go ahead. She worked on the bridge for 11 years. Emily Roebling found it within herself to take her husband's vision and make it into a reality using her own expression. Literally joining together thousands of people between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Way above the ground, the bridge became a visual symbol of connection and triumph over adversity. And bringing that thought closer to home again, let's move back to London where similar connections have been made in places that are a little less visible, but still manages to bring people together. The London Underground, or the Tube as most of us call it, is used by millions of people every day. It's a great leveller. People from all walks of life rub shoulders, quite literally, in the carriages, platforms and tunnels. And that could be seen as mass participation. As an engineer, it reminds me of the big thinking and bold pioneering vision behind these large projects. So I'm standing in the shaft of the Brunel Museum, which is in Rotherhithe in London. The reason I really love it is because it's the first ever tunnel under a navigable river. The real innovation that Mark Brunel came up with was this huge, incredible piece of kit called the shield. They basically burrowed out and then shifted the entire apparatus forward. And then brick layers behind them lay brick down and formed the tunnel, which is actually below my feet. It was an engineering innovation and hugely pioneering project. And even though it was used with much fanfare for the beginning few years, it actually fell quite quickly into disrepair. And it wasn't really until the railways came in that it got its new lease of life. I think the legacy of the Brunel Tunnel is really, really fascinating because on one hand, it really enabled us to move and grow and develop as a city and it probably made London what it is today to some extent. But on the other hand, what we often don't know or aren't aware of is that it has a history that was steeped in fatalities and failure. The mixed history of the Brunel Tunnel can lead us to thinking about the conflicting feelings that people have about another type of structure. Skyscrapers can be a bit of a funny one, can't they? They're quite divisive. People either love them or they hate them. But as an engineer, I see a legacy of collaboration when I look at buildings like the Shard, the Heron Tower, or the Gherkin, which is behind me. I really quite enjoyed all the nerdy aspects of my engineering degree. But one of the things that I only really understood once I started work is what a collaborative profession engineering is. And that's something that I think Fazlur Khan absolutely excelled at. And he's a real hero of mine. But what he did that is so extraordinary 
was he collaborated with designers right at the beginning of that process of envisioning what a skyscraper might look like. What he did was to completely change the design of skyscrapers. Until then, skyscrapers traditionally had a backbone or a spine running through the center of the tower, and he literally flipped it inside out and put the stability system on the outside of the tower. Big diamond shapes that you can see are not there just to make the building look nice. They actually keep the building stable against wind forces. I like this idea of people from different professions coming together and finding a shared language. Some parts of the city that are absolutely vital to the city's success, to the health of its citizens, can be hidden and you can't see them. And sewage systems are one great example of this. I'm standing on the top of the Victoria Embankment, which was built as part of London's sewage system back in the mid-1800s, because the River Thames was basically an open sewer at the time, and that was still where Londoners were getting their drinking water. So in 1856, the smell of all of this got so bad that they called that year the Great Stink, and they finally commissioned engineer Joseph Bazalgette to build his London-wide, immense underground sewage system. So Joseph Bazalgett was designing the system in a time where London's population was two million, but he designed his system for four million people, anticipating that the population of London was about to increase. Today, about 150 years on, the population of London is actually over eight million people, and we're still using his system today. You might think I'm a little bit weird for saying this, but I actually see London's sewage system as being a great example of a mass inclusive project. Because after all, this piece of infrastructure was designed to serve all of us. As designers of future physical and social spaces, as creators of the places where new and lasting connections will be forged, what can we do to envision and ensure a more united and inclusive world for ourselves and for others? And how can we work together to build that?